and I'll be your moderator for today. We have three, three objectives for the dialogue today. One is to provide a platform for women human rights defenders to give us a first-hand account of the, fund, of the attacks on fundamental freedoms and repression they face. The second objective of today's dialogue is to understand the role of women in leading the pro-democracy protests in Belarus. And the third uh, objective of our dialogue is to learn about the crackdown on civil society organizations in defending women's rights and democratic freedoms. May I request you to keep your microphones muted when you're not speaking. And we have an impressive list of speakers today, and we'll have an opportunity to also ask them some questions a little later. My first order of business is to ask the EU ambassador to the UN, Mr. Olaf Skoog, to give us some brief welcoming and introductory remarks. Over to you, Mr. Skoog. Thank you very much, uh, Mandeep. Uh, I very much agree with your the objectives of uh, this uh, event. Uh, dear colleagues and friends, uh, good morning to everyone from uh, New York and welcome to uh, this uh, our side event on women and girls in Belarus. More than uh, one year since the fraudulent presidential elections, the situation of human rights in Belarus continues to deteriorate as a rapid, at a rapid and unprecedented scale. We will soon hear from Special Rapporteur Anna Ismarin on the impact of the crisis on women and girls. Women in all their diversity have been at the forefront of the popular opposition. They have been leading movements for peace and democracy. In response, they have faced detention, torture and violence, including sexual and gender-based violence. Through this event, we want to honor the hundreds of women who are taking a stance to peacefully defend fundamental freedoms and human rights in Belarus. I'm very happy to welcome to this event Anastasia Kostyugova, Irina Suki, and Anastasia Bekish, and I look forward to hearing their testimonies. Last week, at least 245 NGOs were dissolved by Lukashenko, including Echo Home, the oldest eco initiative led by Irina Suki. We condemn the crackdown against civil society in the stronger terms, strongest terms and stand with Irina and all those affected. There are currently 100, 833 political prisoners in Belarus and more than 270 civil society organizations and independent media have been or are being closed down. The repression must stop. The EU continues to call on the Belarusian authorities to fully respect their obligations under international human rights law. And we insist that all those detained for political reasons must be released immediately and unconditionally, that the Belarusian authorities end their rep repressive practices immediately and enter into genuine dialogue with the representatives of civil society, in particular the Coordination Council. And I want to say that these are calls and messages that we are not just passing in events like this with people who agree with our values, but we do it very clearly to the Belarusian uh, leadership. As we will hear from our Gender and Diversity Ambassador Stella Rohner in a moment, the EU is mobilized to support the people of Belarus. Gender equality and the human rights of women and girls are at the core of EU's external action, including in Belarus. We have published a plan for a 3 billion euro economic and investment package in support of a democratic Belarus that we will activate if and when the country changes its current course. But we want to ensure that the voices of women and girls are heard as we uh, continue these plans and before we materialize them. So you can count on us to continue to highlight the challenges faced by the people of Belarus at the UN and in all relevant fora. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, Ambassador, and more importantly, thank you for telling it like it is and for reaffirming the, the EU's commitment to rights, justice, and equality. It's now my pleasure to call on Anais Marin, the Special Rapporteur on the Situation on Human Rights in Belarus, to share uh, reflections from our key findings. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, hello, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Uh, thank you first for organizing this event and giving me the opportunity to present the main findings of the report on the situation of human rights in Belarus, which I presented to the third committee of the General Assembly last Monday. The report focuses on issues pertaining to the human rights of women in Belarus. It also touches upon human rights of lesbian, bisexual and transgender women, intersex persons and girls. 
Belarus has been known for the past two decades for systemic drawbacks in the human rights field. Yet, as you know, violations over the past 18 months have become systematic and targeted people from all walks of life. My report evidences that women and girls in Belarus suffer from the whole spectrum of violations of fundamental rights and freedoms guaranteed by international human rights law. While the government made some effort in recent years to promote equal rights for women and men, these cosmetic policies and diplomatic announcements meant to display Belarus in a good light among the countries striving to implement the WPS and SDGs have rarely translated into concrete advancement of women's rights in law and in practice. For example, Belarus has no legislation preventing domestic violence and rape, nor has it explicitly criminalized marital rape. Discrimination remains in the workplace and protection gaps are evident in cases of gender-based violence and abuses. For female victims of domestic violence, there is a flagrant lack of protection mechanisms and shelters notably. More important, uh, I would stress that women's rights are being violated because they are discouraged from participating in public life as proactive citizens. This is due to long-standing gendered stereotypes in society that go up to the top of the state. Indeed, female professionals remain underrepresented in most decision-making positions in Belarus. Let me quote some figures from the report. Among the top 24 government ministers, only one is currently a woman. The current head of the presidential administration is a man, and so are three of his four deputies. The gender imbalance is worse among the heads of regional administrations at oblast level. The president has never appointed a woman to any such position. Finally, according to available data in 2020, only 3.4% of ambassadors were women. On the other hand, women are overrepresented in some professional categories which have paid a very heavy toll for doing their jobs in the past two years. Medical workers, journalists, human rights defenders and lawyers. Let me stress that whenever one of them has been detained or sentenced to administrative or, or criminal detention, these women have for the most part left behind children who are also as a collateral damage affected by the current crackdown. In fact, of particular concern is the backlash that women expressing dissenting views critical of the government and its policies are facing since the start of the ongoing human rights crisis. Many of the approximately 33,000 people arbitrarily detained since May 2020 were women and girls. Peaceful protesters have been confronted with intimidation, threats, pressure and violence aimed at discouraging their civic and political activism. Several were subjected to torture, ill treatment and other forms of physical and psychological pressure, including rape or threat of rape in detention. Some suffered from additional humiliating practices, such as being denied access to hygiene products and medical services in detention, all this amid the COVID pandemic. More worryingly still, some women were victims of enforced disappearances, while thousands of others have been pushed to a forced exile for fear of repression and retaliation. As an expert who dedicated over a decade to research on Belarus, I find admirable the way women and girls peacefully stood up for their rights and continue doing so in a constructive spirit, despite oppression, intimidations and threats, including reprisals directed against their partners, parents or children. Their courage and grassroots empowerment is all inspiring for all women and girls who seek respect for their rights to a better life, free of violence and discrimination. The developments of the last three months since I finalized the report illustrate a very worrying trend whereby the government continues to curtail civil and political rights, notably the rights to freedom of assembly, association and expression, but also attempts to fully suppress civil society. In 2020 alone, 480 journalists were reportedly detained while performing their duties, of which 163 were women. In recent months, as was recalled by the ambassador, over 270 civil society organizations have been targeted by procedures of liquidation. Dozens of lawyers defending clients in so-called political cases have been disbarred or otherwise so their license suspended on abusive disciplinary grounds, thereby depriving their clients of the right to defense. This trend amounts to purging civil society from undesirable people and it has forced hundreds of thousands of people to a forced exile abroad. 
Since July, multiple raids took place and dozens of human rights defenders were arrested and faced long prison terms. Among them are members of the Belarusian Helsinki Committee, the Belarusian Association of Journalists, Human Rights Center of Yasna, Low Trend, Human Constanta, and others who play an invaluable role to inform my mandate and other international human rights mechanisms. The authorities have tightened the screws also by weaponizing the amended Code of Administrative Offenses, laws on combating ex extremism and the financing of terrorism, and laws on mass media and mass events to crack down on dissent and retaliate against those whom we consider at the UN as victims of human rights violations. Legislation is now even applied retroactively in an attempt at criminalizing otherwise benign offenses and deterring further protest online or offline. These laws unjustifiably restrict the field for public debate and participation and their selective implementation seems geared mainly towards punishing dissent. The mass exile of human rights practitioners, academics and activists from Belarus illustrates a general atmosphere of fear in the country, which is exacerbated by the persistent impunity for perpetrators of grave human rights violations who continue acting boldly without fear of facing justice for their crimes. Yet they will have to be held accountable. And let me use that opportunity to remind that my mandate alongside other independent experts is working closely with the OHCHR examination of Belarus what, that was established pursuant of Human Rights Council Resolution 46 20. We have compiled and analyzed evidence which will be made available to any prosecutor willing to adjudicate the massive violations allegedly perpetrated in Belarus since May 2020. As for the recommendations contained in my report, unfortunately, they reiterate those already made by various UN mechanisms, including the UPR, and which the government of Belarus keeps on ignoring for the most part. In fact, the authorities have lent a deaf ear to all calls from the international community to engage in a meaningful dialogue with civil society and the political opposition in order to overcome the current political uh, crisis. Uh, since 2020, Belarus saw unprecedented public and peaceful activism, especially from women and girls who showed leadership and resilience in standing up for human rights and dignity. I call, the op the, I call upon the authorities to see this activism not as a threat, but as an opportunity for improving the protection of all human rights for all. In fact, I believe that these brave women can be a driver for ensuring the promotion of human rights in Belarus in the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Marin, and thank you for highlighting that women and girls face the full spectrum of human rights violations in Belarus, and that the cosmetic announcements are not having an impact on the systemic imbalances that exist in society. And also for highlighting about the breakdown of rule of law which is resulting in grave human rights violations and impunity, and for highlighting the need to ensure accountability for these violations so that they do not occur on a recurring basis. My, my next order of the day is to introduce Stella Rona Grubach, uh, Grubachik, the EU Ambassador for Gender and Diversity. The floor is yours, Ambassador. I hope Thank I, you. I, I uh, name right. The second time you did, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for having me uh, join you today. Uh, I'm very happy to be in your midst, even though this is virtual, of course, and uh, obviously my special greetings go to Anastasia Kostyugova, to Irina Suki, and to Anastasia Pekish, and I hope I pronounced that right as well. Um, uh, I think what is really important today is that this really provides with an opportunity to all of us to listen to your recommendations on what more we can do to support the women and the women human rights defenders of Belarus. Let me start, and there I'm echoing, of course, uh, our ambassador in New York uh, uh, by reassuring you that the EU continues to stand firm against Lukashenko's regime uh, uh, and his human rights violations and the un unlawful actions directed at its uh, citizens and neighbors. I do hope that you have all heard uh, Commissioner Johansson saying in a speech to the European Parliament on the 20th of October, 
that it is time to discuss further sanctions. And this statement of hers was actually preceded by another one uh, where, she clear, where she made it very clear that, and there I quote again, there is no way back to business as usual. So clearly the political and human rights situation in Belarus is worsening. Lukashenko's regime is carrying out a systematic effort to silence all remaining independent voices in the country. And here we are talking about not only the independent press uh, or human rights defenders, but also civil society at large. The EU continues to work for justice for the victims and for, it was mentioned uh, previously, the accountability of the perpetrators. This includes the establishment of mechanisms to hold the perpetrators of human rights violations responsible. And we continue to raise the human rights situation in all relevant international fora. The state-run instrumentalization of migrants is another example of Lukashenko's disregard of international norms. The EU has reacted with solidarity, providing support to affected member states and through diplomatic outreach to countries of origin or transit. We are also ready to react to further attempts to destabilize the EU and its member states. Being in this forum today, let me underline once again, uh, again, it was mentioned also by the, uh, our ambassador in New York, our special concern for the situation of women and girls in Belarus. We know that the Belarusian authorities have intensified their practice of reprisals against human rights defenders, also targeting very much women's rights defenders and undermining the work of women journalists and bloggers. And let me be clear on one point, civil society in our view is a critical resource and partner for democracy, for human rights, justice and sustainable development. Any society that doesn't manage to meaningfully include and engage with civil society faces the severe, faces severe challenges. So dear participants and dear all, what we see now is a conservative approach to discuss gender equality once democracy wins and when the most pressing issues are dealt with. We have seen this in too many other places where gender equality is dealt with rather as an afterthought and something we can discuss when the uh, more important and burning issues, so to speak, between quotation marks, are solved. We all know too well that this approach is fundamentally wrong and it is short-sighted. Gender equality must be mainstreamed into democratic transition and reforms from the early outset and discussions on design as there will be no democracy without gender equality. Women's leadership and participation are obviously critical for the future of Belarus and for its democracy. And this is why this session that we are having today is so important. I want to state very clearly again, we are the European Union and we hold ourselves to the rule of law and the rule of law protects the values on which our union is founded. Freedom, democracy, equality and respect for human rights. To conclude, I'm looking really very much forward to listening to the panel and its recommendations. And let me assure you that I will bring those to the political leadership of the European Union and to be able to discuss with them how best we can further support the women and women human rights defenders of Belarus. So on that, I thank you and I wish you all success with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Gubacek. And you assured us that the European Union will stand firm in the face of unlawful violations. You also raised the issue of violations happening in various places and about reprisals against human rights defenders and civil society activists. 
And importantly, you emphasized your support for gender equality and for uh, rule of law. It's now my pleasure to go to the panel and we have a, a set of questions for them. Our first panelist is Anastasia Kostigova, who's the co-founder of the Women Protests Movement in Belarus and a representative of the office of Svetlana uh, Sushnokoya, uh, the presidential candidate. And Anastasia, please correct me on the pronunciation there. So the, my question for you, Anastasia, is how are women and girls leading and shaping the pro-democracy movement in Belarus? And what are the challenges you're facing in exercising your right to peaceful assembly, which is an important part of customary international law? Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for having me here. And it's a big an honor. So uh, the first problem we have is a uh, criminal cases that the regime starts against you as soon as you go out to the street and look suspicious to some of the officers. Maybe it's your socks color or something else. Maybe you just looked at him in a bad way. And don't you dare to come to the square or just street and bring a poster with you because it's very cruel and big regime is so scared by your voice that they will take you immediately. So the main problem is that you, uh, the main problem is that you pay with freedom and sometimes with your life for your right to assemble. Uh, for a start, we could go out and hope not to be detained uh, to, due to the administrative arrest. But now uh, there's, there's uh, criminal cases and it was just sexism at first, which did not allow them to hit women, women and throw grenades at them. After a while, they realized that the women should not, not be pitied either. So now we do not have any problems with the right to, to peaceful assembly. We simply do not have the right to, peace, to peaceful assembly. Thank you, Anastasia, about that and for raising the issue of criminalization of democratic dissent. Our second panelist today is Irina Suki, environmental activist and founder of EcoHume, one of the oldest environmental nonprofit organizations in Belarus. Irina, what impediments are you facing in the, in the exercise of the right to freedom of association? You yourself have faced a lot of personal depression in your work as a civil society activist. Please do share your views. We might you might need to unmute yourself. Oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I would like to start uh, that Echo Home was established in uh, 1996. It was a short period after uh, the collapse of Soviet Union, when uh, democratic changes in the country contribute to the development of civil society. Then after Lukashenko came in power, the situation uh, began to change. And first crackdown on civil society organization was in 1999. Then we uh, experienced the second in 2003, 2004. Then working condition gradually uh, uh, deteriorated until 2021. But there was not so such unprecedented attack on NGO that happens this summer and continues to this day. Following police raids of NGO offices and individuals' homes, the authorities began to shut down uh, prominent civil society organization. At the moment, uh, more than 20, 250 organizations were liquidated and uh, Echo Home was uh, in the top 10 uh, for liquidation. Uh, but uh, if I look a little bit back, uh, we start experience pressure, probably the, the, uh, more, more pressure since 2008, when we start protesting against the construction of nuclear power plant. And uh, uh, Cajon began to experience problems where we denied registration of grant from international donors, uh, educational institutions were advised not to cooperate with the home, and we were forced to close our education ECA programs for teachers. Members of our organizations and experts were detained and received administrative arrest, and our Russian colleague uh, was expelled from the country for 10 years. 
uh, it was impossible uh, to obtain uh, permission to hold piquets on demonstration. And uh, at the annual Osirizide, probably one of the two Osirizide demonstration in our country dedicated to Chernobyl disaster, uh, we usually were preventally detained and couldn't take part in it. Uh, coming to this year, uh, on the 21st of June, we celebrated 25 years of existing of a home. But next day, we received a letter about the beginning of inspection by the Minister of Justice, which ended in Supreme Court with the claim of, from the Minister of Justice to liquidate our organization. Uh, and it happens in, in August, uh, our organization was liquidated. But last week uh, at the me uh, meeting of the parties of the Orhus Convention, this decision was recognized as the suppression and harassment of environmental defenders. Um, uh, at the moment, uh, after searches in our at homes of, of the leaders and activists of a home, uh, with the threat of criminal uh, prosecution, we were forced to leave the country. But we were not stop our, our work. Uh, we continue uh, to work on protection of the right for health environment in our country, and we will not, not stop. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Irina, and thank you for taking us to the trajectory of repression uh, in, the, in the country and, uh, and also all the impediments that you're facing in your work. We'll now move to our third panelist, Anastasia Bekish, who's an advisor at Reconomy Program at Helvetas, which in, works on inclusive and green economic development in Eastern Europe and the Western Balkans. Anastasia, what role do you see for women-led organizations and movements to resolve the current impasse in the country and uh, bearing on what we've heard from uh, our previous panelists. Thank you very much, Mandeep. Dear colleagues, excellences, it's a pleasure and honor for me to be here with you today. And indeed, women and girls in Belarus demonstrated enormous courage and became a source of inspiration and one of the key driving forces of the democratic movement in Belarus. Women still being a vulnerable group, uh, discriminated at the global level and suffering from violence and exclusion, are also the primary source for peace building and democracy. And thus empowering women and girls means also promotion of reconciliation uh, and development, particularly in the fragile states like Belarus currently. The ability of women to negotiate and influence their communities and dynamics of change and their professional groups can't be underestimated, it thus should be supported in all possible ways. My colleagues have already covered very well the ongoing situation with the civil society organizations in Belarus and organizations working uh, with the topics of gender-based violence and women empowerment in general, along with other civil society organizations and movements, often very much women-led in Belarus, are suffering tremendously from the actions uh, of the current ruling government in our country. Uh, and it significantly limits their ability to work to reach their target audience, uh, which also results in the psychological problems and burnouts among the leaders and staff of such organizations. Due to my personal history, I'm combining the experience of being in the shoes of activists and uh, also leader of the civic organizations in Belarus, working with Irina for many, many years. But also now I'm an external person looking at the situation from the perspective of international community. And I think that community of friends of Belarus, our country should on the one hand support uh, the civil society organizations by creating the safe space and I mean physical and also psychological mental dimension. And this is what indeed happening extensively with support of uh, various international programs and the response fund from the European Union also. And it allows people to relocate, to have some way, uh, rest and breathe after the experience they had inside the country and to start rethinking the approaches and perspectives of their organizations and work, still work for Belarusian future. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, for the civil society organizations, I believe that 
hopefully after being able to put the oxygen mask on their cell. They should do their best to think strategically and question themselves in the process of reassessment of their strategies, how their actions bring them closer to the day when they return home and avoid business as usual practices and try to coordinate strategies as much as possible with other actors, especially those remaining in the country uh, and to engage the international community for innovative practices and options. So to summarize, uh, avoiding the disconnection and fragmentation of the civil society and investing in collaboration and coordination is the key recipe in my mind for the actors willing to keep the democratic movement in the vibrant. Thank you, Mandip. Thank you, Anastasia. We'll move to a second round of questions. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to um, um, ask our um, uh, viewers who are, who are on, on this um, conversation that if they have any questions for the panelists, please do paste them in the chat function and we'll collate them and, and, uh, and, and take them to the panelists later on in, in the program today. Uh, I, I want to go back to you, Anastasia uh, Kostigiova. Uh, what's been lacking in the response of the international community to the situation in Belarus? And you know, what would you like the international community to do to support you in your cause and in your struggle? Uh, well, at first, I want to talk about the situation when many uh, uh, women are now forced to flee with their children and when uh, their husbands are taken away uh, to a prison and they find themselves in another country without money, without work, without hosting, and they need to feed their children and they was very dependent of them, of their husbands. And I know the story of a woman whose husband was in prison. She spent a week in apartments of various friends, acquaintances and completely strangers with her two children. And then she crossed the border across the river. And I mean, literally she swam across the river because, because her passport, the, uh, because uh, the KGB decided to keep her, her passport. She lived for a week in a refugee camp the same came that appeared that thanks to the crisis created by Lukashenko on the borders of Lithuania, Portia, and Ukraine. And she finally allowed to enter in Lithuania and she ended up in Vilnius and uh, where people from diaspora could take care of her. But I know a lot of stories like that uh, when there is no one to take care of a woman in this kind of situation. And we have this um, problem in a different government and uh, we need to have this mechanism to help those women because they are very vulnerable in this situation and they can help themselves. Um, and we have uh, other interesting issue here because when uh, someone thinks about Belarusian women, he thinks about uh, or she thinks about uh, very brave women fighting for democracy. But uh, we have other side. We have. Um, uh, what about women supporting the regime now? And they uh, they do this not because they are bad persons, but they are trying to survive. And they um, don't know that there is something better exists. Actually, there's a better system that can that can help them. And they actually think they uh, they are uh, have no way out. So actually, we're thinking of uh, creating some uh, educational programs and retraining programs for, for women who now serving actually for regime, not making any decisions, but serve the regime. And we uh, want to, to show them something and something other, something better to, you know, to help them leave uh, the, um, uh, the violator actually. So, um, and we have a lot of women who run an NGO in Belarus now, uh, and maybe this NGO don't have official registra registration now because of repression, uh, but they are continuous to work, and therefore it is necessary to establish working mechanisms to help them, uh, to fund them, uh, and uh, it's not a problem. They don't have any official registration now, but they can still do their work. Thank you very much uh, for sharing that, Anastasia, and especially about the need for a humanitarian response and practical solutions to some of the challenges uh, that, that are being faced. 
Uh, I, I want to go to you, Irina. Uh, and, and my question to you is, what message would you like to convey to democratic governments, to the European Union, who's, who support uh, struggles for democracy and human rights as pillars of their foreign policy? Yeah, I, I could uh, support what was already said by Anastasia, uh, but also uh, I want you members and uh, states and other democratic uh, countries uh, stay motivated and inspired by the courage, humanity and dignity of Belarusian, Belarusian fighting for the democracy. And uh, it was a, a big pleasure to hear today uh, from the ambassadors that uh, EU uh, stand firm on, uh, on supporting Belarus. Uh, and, uh, but we already last, last week saw, saw that sometimes uh, 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 wish to, uh, to seek for con consensus or compromise. Uh, could uh, could bring to the uh, uh, the treatment of democratic values uh, and human rights values. So uh, we really want that you should stay firm on uh, these values. It's impossible to find compromise with uh, re the Belarusian regime at the moment, um, and. Uh, we uh, another thing that uh, we really need uh, we feel the support but uh, it could be probably uh, uh, make uh, some uh, more efforts for example with visa support we are very thankful to Lithuanian and Poland uh, and Poland that tried they that do their best uh, to give this visa support to Belarusians who need to leave the country. But for example, Lithuanian embassy in a very hard situation, they have probably one or two staff left, uh, but other uh, embassies in Belarus didn't really uh, make some efforts to, to support with visas Belarusian citizens. Um, uh, another thing that, uh, uh, it's really important uh, to uh, that the response to the problem uh, will be more fast. We're very thankful to the EU delegation, the EU Commission, uh, which support um, civil society. But uh, the round of decision making is quite long. And uh, finally, when we receive the support, uh, it was uh, we. It was year, uh, half a year, or if we were man, uh, able uh, to uh, to get the support previously, maybe uh, it will be uh, safe. Not safe, but it will be help. Uh, the situation will not turn so so dramatically. Uh, we also call for further efforts to gather evidence about crimes and to establish mechanism in order to hold all perpetrators to account. Facts gathered by impartial and independent international expert will, uh, would assist uh, any international facilitated dialogue. Um, this is, will be my message <laughs> to the democratic countries. Thank you, Irina. Stay firm, stay motivated, stay inspired uh, by your planet. <laughs> That's, I think, an important message. And also to ensure that accountability is not compromised. I want to move to you, uh, Anastasia Rekic. Uh, I know that you've been working on economic issues. Uh, what's, what's your message uh, uh, on how the how what support can be offered to ensure that no one is left behind in the situation of Belarus. Thank you for your question, Mandeep. Uh, I think first of all we need to set the ground and admit very clearly that the current situation in Belarus is characterized with a high degree of fragility, combination of lack of legitimacy of the acting government, 
uh, actively exercising the violence and repressions against its own citizens and the consequences of COVID-19 pandemic is highly irrelevant and irresponsible approach of the state altogether keep the so-called perfect storm in Belarus going. Uh, as we all know, in the fragile context, uh, inequalities for the exclusion and discrimination are skyrocketing and associated with the tremendous growth in the gender-based violence, lack of access to justice and the exclusion of women and girls from any kind of decision-making. Forceful liquidation and repressions against civil society organizations dealing with gender and women empowerment uh, as we discussed before, led to the situation when such organizations previously performing their functions continuously abandoned by the Belarusian state, and now in the crisis situation seeking for their way for survival, still trying to do the best for their support of the vulnerable groups in Belarus. To narrow down a bit the focus of my message, I'd like to talk about the impact of the ongoing crisis on the economic situation of women, and young uh, people in Belarus, and uh, it was widely discussed and underlined in many analytical papers covering the roles of actors for change in Belarusian democratic movement that the tectonic change in the Belarusian society has a strong linkage to the growing level of education, economic empowerment, and independence of women who found themselves in the position when they want and they can advocate and fight for their better future. Now, however, with the serious deterioration of the economic situation and politically based repressions, women are spiraling back to the vulnerability and exclusion. And in particular, this is relevant for those women living in the rural area in small towns across the country, those not having the access to high class education, those without sufficient skills for doing the business. Many of such women lost their jobs in the state owned sector of economy struggling to sustain their macro and small business. And these women, on the one hand, being the driving force for the Belarusian revolution, now have all the risks to be forgotten and unfortunately left alone, facing all the complex changes existing in the country. Um, so coming back to your question, what the UN and its agencies, as well as international aid community in general can do, I believe that we need to look carefully at the needs of the regular people remaining in the country, not being able or unwilling to relocate to another states, but also dealing with the shrinking space for voice and inclusion and generally surviving now in the unsupportive environment. The case of Belarus has shown and confirmed how much women's economic empowerment is interlinked with the progress in human rights and democracy building. Thus, also, there is a lot of unclarity on the ways of operating in Belarus and a lot of discussions on the possible strategies among the international community. It's our responsibility to take the risk uh, and to support Belarusian civil society organizations working with these target groups and find the innovative ways together uh, in line with do no harm approach, of course, uh, but reaching those who stay in the country and keep the country alive. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia, and thank you for highlighting the role of the UN, particularly in safeguarding civic space and also in addressing the challenges of vulnerability and exclusion from a gender perspective. We will now move to uh, state interventions. Uh, but before we go there, I just did want to ask the, the participants that if they have any questions, please do paste them on the chat and we'll collate them and, and go back to the panel and to uh, Special Rapporteur Marin uh, later in the program. Uh, I now have the pleasure to invite the Latvian Permanent Representative to the UN, Ambassador Andres Pildegovic, to give uh, their remarks. Good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm Andrei Studegovich, Latvian PR here at New York. And I, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for, for this event and uh, for to External Action Service and European Commission delegation for supporting this discussion. I want to start by saying that Latvia is a member of the Committee on the Status of Women will be a very strong defender of and protection of the women human rights and uh, we will definitely support this very important part of the agenda. 
We believe that women human rights defenders are not only promoting human rights, but they mobilize the society to highlight human rights violations and contribute to gender mainstreaming at all levels of decision maker making. Uh, women human rights defenders are indispensable and sustainable peace building activities. And unfortunately, they are not constantly excluded from the peace process and participation policy making. And we will also be on the peace building commission next year, so we will advocate for that. Uh, when it comes to Belarus, I would like to highlight again that we remain very concerned about the deteriorating human rights situation in Belarus. Just two days ago in the third commission uh, committee, uh, we had a discussion on Belarus and for the first time, Belarusian authorities completely ignored this discussion, signaling uh, disregard and uh, denial of the UN processes in, in human rights sphere and this is of course very worrying uh, apart from the government's backing uh, i want to highlight that the latvian civil society ngos private sector provides support to the belarusian civil society and uh, i want to highlight particularly the work of uh, center marta and latin platform for development cooperation which is providing uh, legal psychological practical medical assistance to women who have suffered from the unjustified repressions by the Belarusian authorities. And particularly important is psychological training for Belarusian specialists who are working with the victims. Latvia will continue to support the efforts of Belarusian women and human rights defenders to build the, uh, and live in a free and sovereign, prosperous, democratic Belarus. We certainly continue to urge the Belarusian authorities to stop repressions and to start the inclusive process which will lead eventually to inclusive pluralistic uh, election electoral process, which will resolve the current crisis. I thank, I thank again uh, all organizers and civil society groups for your testimonies. These, these are very important and please count on Latvia's continuous support. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And I'm sure your support means a lot to activists facing really very challenging situations on the ground. And your call for an inclusive process is an important one. And now uh, hand the floor to the Estonian Deputy Permanent Representative to the UN, Andre Lepand, to share their comments. Thank you very much. Um, and then thank you very much for all the speakers today for, for your relentless work and, and your courage. Uh, hearing your voices at the UN, I believe, is essential. We also welcome the efforts of the EU and Civicus to make today's event possible. Uh, not only are the human rights violations in Belarus gross and systemic, the situation continues to deteriorate day by day. Those standing up for their most basic human rights continue to face blatant repressions targeting every aspect of their life. The face of the opposition to these violations has been strongly female, uh, reflecting its key features that, that I must underline. It's a non movement of diverse people from all walks of life and of all ages who just want to, who just want respect for their rights, their freedoms, democracy and rule of law. The women who have been part of these protests have shown inventiveness and resilience despite intimidation, threats, imprisonment, torture and violence, including sexual and gender-based violence, and also smear campaigns. As the Special Rapporteur has noted, these measures often make use of the stereotypes and existing inequalities in society and aim to put women back in their place. Silencing women journalists, activists, cultural figures is part of an effort to silence and stub out the civic space in Belarus. Our duty, the duty of the international community, is not to leave them alone. We need to hear them and uh, demand monitoring and accountability for violations against them through the UN treaty bodies, special procedures and intergovernmental bodies. Estonia will continue to raise the human rights violations in Belarus in international fora, including in the human, UN Human Rights Council and the Security Council. 
bringing representatives of the Belarusian civil society, including women, to UN discussions has been part of this effort. We will also continue to support the Belarusian civil society, media freedom and services to those women and men who have been targeted by the regime. I'd conclude by thanking again the organizers and civil society and the panelists uh, for their work today and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lefant, and thank you for reaffirming Estonia's commitment to, uh, to, uh, to a human rights-based approach in key uh, UN forums, and also for your, for your standing with those who are facing reprisals. I now hand the floor to Minister Counselor of the Permanent Mission of Sweden to the United Nations, Leonard Peck, to share their remarks. Okay, thank you very much, Excellencies, distinguished participants. Um, first of all, let me take this opportunity to thank you, Anastasia Pekish, Anastasia Kostogova, and Irina Suki, for being with us here today, sharing with us your insights, your experiences, the challenges that you are facing, and not the least for the many concrete suggestions as to what we in the international community can do. That's very valuable. As Sweden has expressed at many occasions, we strongly condemn the human rights violations in Belarus, documented well in the special by the special rapporteur, and that we also heard first-hand accounts of today talking about the authorities' brutal force, the intimidation against people with dissenting views, the targeting of civil society actors, human rights defenders, media workers, not the least women, as we've heard, that have been at the forefront of the popular opposition to the government's repression, but also, as well described in the report, the human rights violations stemming from more structural gender inequalities affecting all women and girls. This repression must come to an end and perpetrators should be held to account. Now, what certainly gives inspiration, yes, and hope is the courage and the determination shown by you and other Belarusian women and human rights defenders. So we continue to stand with you and the Belarusian people in this struggle for democracy and human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Peck, uh, for your remarks and for Sweden's support. I now invite Deputy Permanent Representative of Poland to the UN, Joanna Skwesek, to give their remarks. Thank you very much. And I would like to start by thanking the, all the panelists for their participation and then providing us with their moving personal accounts. And uh, I would like to underline that Poland, uh, obviously, continuous distance in the solidarity with you, with Belarusian civil society in the fight for peaceful and democratic Belarus. And I must say it's uh, probably the fifth, maybe sixth time within two weeks that I participate in an event organized in the UN or around the UN within the committees or a society event uh, that is dedicated to Belarus and especially to Belarusian women. And I'm uh, very glad to see that these uh, efforts and the struggle uh, has been uh, somehow noted here in, uh, in New York and that we can, through all those discussions, by inviting people and involving people, uh, just tell the story about what is going on in Belarus and also to discuss how we can help. Uh, as a woman, as a diplomat, uh, and as a person who is involved in, in public life for, for more than 25 years, I, uh, I absolutely appreciate uh, the activity and the role that was played by women and uh, by uh, girls in the struggle for demo democratic Belarus. And it's, uh, it's a kind of a phenomenon that uh, women in Belarus stepped up. Uh, they've been somehow pushed to be leaders, to become leaders. Many of, uh, of, of women, many of our colleagues in Belarus, they, in the very first phase, they, they uh, just were there to substitute for their absent, arrested, imprisoned husbands, partners, and colleagues. But then 
they became the real leaders themselves and they will be leaders uh, in the future. And so we, we wish them to be the leaders of democratic Belarus. It's, uh, it's a proof that, uh, that women working together uh, can do things that uh, are unimaginable before they happen. So I would like to convey our strong message of support and the best wishes. And uh, please count on us as much as we can help and support you. Uh, congratulations for, for your work and be strong. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kozak, for that humane and inspiring message. Uh, we, we do have some questions for the panel that I'm, that I'm going to share here. And perhaps maybe I could ask the panelists to, uh, to, to, to decide which ones they want to address. So we have three questions. One is, can you tell us a little more about the situation of women human rights defenders in the country? What specific threats or security issues are you facing for speaking out? And uh, if there's anything, any specific threats that you faced yourselves, please do share the details of, of, of those. So Anastasia, Irina, uh, and Anastasia, if, if, uh, please uh, feel free to come in. So perhaps maybe Irina is maybe I can begin with you to share any specific threats that you may have faced. Yeah, specific threats, but um, I already described most of them. But. Uh, um, Uh, what uh, could you clarify a little bit more? What what kind yeah. of uh, threats you are looking for? <laughs> yes, no, no, you you're right. I think I think what you have you have explained very much in in detail some of the threats that that you that you've been faced that you faced, and I think uh, the, the, that's that's certainly fair. So perhaps maybe just to build on that question, I mean. You know, are there any protection mechanisms? Are there any places when when activists face threats? What what do they do? I mean, how how are they able to respond? What's the response of the authorities to some of the security challenges they face? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, in our country, as you already learned, there is a legal default, so there is no normal uh, mechanism to protect our rights. Uh, rights. We we cannot expect that if we will uh, go to court, uh, it will be fair court, and we will receive uh, normal uh, good, I would say, di uh, distance uh, uh, result, uh, because uh, everything is uh, turned against activist, and uh, uh, the only, I would say. Uh, the only possibility is just to hide when 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 they come into you uh, there is no uh, mechanism to protect yourself uh, so uh, that is why so many people already leave the country uh, because we cannot find uh, justice inside the country and the only protection is just to go out to leave the country. Um, uh, of course, uh, we support each other when, for example, I was inside of Belarus. Of course, we tried to support each other as much as possible. And we support pe uh, all the people who are in prison, uh, uh, tried to collect money uh, uh, for, for, for to, to, to give some, uh, support to the prisoners. Uh, we write letters to them uh, to support them morally. Uh, but uh, we cannot uh, make a, something which can uh, release them from the prison. And this is really make us uh, very, I would say, uh, depressed and disappointed. Uh, 
because the only uh, possibility to release all these people who now in the prisons is just to change the regime. And uh, uh, this is what, what for we have to fight. And, uh, and also uh, what, what uh, we are looking uh, support for, from the international community. Thank you very much, Irina. That was very helpful. And my apologies for putting, uh, for, for throwing that question so suddenly on you. So uh, I, I think just to follow up, there's a, there's a question here and perhaps maybe uh, Anastas, uh, An 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 Anastasias can help us here is, is about best practices. So perhaps are there any best practices that, uh, you know, that, uh, that there are to share in support of uh, how civil society has been able to respond to some of the threats that uh, are there any 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 positive experience that you might have that you may want to share um i can i can tell a little bit about it about positive experience it's uh i don't have uh, you know very much positive experience in our country now but uh we actually came back to you know to those uh, time where people printed news on a paper and spread it in the country. So this is uh, what works. And this is the, you know, the, sometimes it, this is the only way to spread some information because uh, our government have the power to, to block some websites. Uh, we don't have any access to the TV and we have very big problem with the media in the country. And actually the free freedom of media uh, is very important and we don't have any of it. So um, once you try to create something new to tell the truth, uh, they can block it immediately. So um, this is uh, this is why we trying to print the news on a on a paper and spread it uh, spread it on a, in a city in a Minsk and in a, in the regions, and it's kind of work because it's a it's a way to to inform people about what's happening. Uh, because it's uh, it's a way to inform people about uh, their uh, you know their money issues uh, about the political situation uh, because they don't have any other um, channels to have this information because not, uh, not every one of them are reading the Telegram channels, not every one of them watching YouTube, but actually YouTube can start start growing because uh, it's like. Uh, second TV now in Belarus because people start to understand that uh, they can't find something real in a, uh, on a CV. Uh, we actually have to understand that not everyone in Belarus have Telegram, not everyone in Belarus uh, actually use internet as much as I am or every one of us. Uh, so we need to, to find a way to, you know, to touch them, to break this uh, bubble and uh, to spread this information. And we need to speak to those people who actually maybe still don't understand this connection between political crisis in the country and their money issues, for example, or maybe uh, the, um, I don't know, the um, problems in the schools or uh, kindergarten, kindergartens. And um, this is connected things and this is our work to explain them that it's not like uh, maybe I have money issues, but it's uh, it have nothing to do with the politics in my country. We're trying to explain them that this is this is there this is uh, there is actually real strong connection between between it. So we now we need to inv uh, to involve more audience. Uh, we actually haven't spoke before because we uh, we spoke with the audience who was actively against the the situation in the, in the country and now we need to to speak with some uh, with the audience who like okay uh, we don't like when people are beaten you know but we don't understand why it's happening now in the country and they are actually things more about um, economic and, and uh, you know, your everyday problems. So uh, now we start to talk with, the, with this audience, we're trying to do this. And actually it's, uh, 
interesting, but it works because we have more and more audience on that kind of topics. And actually, this is how we can uh, we start, uh, and we need to start to speak with the women in the country who are actually uh, afraid of politics and even word politics. And we need to, you know, to to hide these uh, values in some topics they care about. Because uh, when we try to talk about human rights, everyone is afraid because it, you know in our country now it's very scary to speak about human rights or just speak not uh, I don't speak about like uh, do something for that. So when we um, when we trying to speak about something else, something every day, something they care about like daily, uh, but uh, you know bringing it some values. Uh, Maybe it could work better. So uh, we need more media con media content for people who were uh, who weren't wasn't involved before. Thank you very much for sharing that, and that's that's really uh, profound and, and very very helpful. Uh, I know that uh, Anastasia Bekesh was also wanted wanted to come in. Uh, thank you, uh, Mantip. I'd like to answer the question from the chat from Estonian delegation, how the human rights defenders from around the globe can share their experience and best, best practices with Belarusian CSOs. And in this case, the answer is very short, uh, and I would like to underline the importance of the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum, uh, which has been for a long term platform for exchange and collaboration in the region and unites currently over uh, thousands of organizations, including the Belarusian human rights defenders and other types of the civil society organizations. And the Belarusian national platform of the civil society forum is active, and this is one of the sources of collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'd, I'd like to go to Special Rapporteur Marin uh, with, with a question. Uh, 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 Anais, what, what particular challenges do you face with regards to your mandate and how can you know, uh, those of us in civil society and, and, and governments and uh, the United Nations and others support your mandate? Thank you, Mandeep. <clears throat> Well, you know, uh, the Special Rapporteur on Belarus mandate has always been seen as uh, politicized. It's among those mandates <clears throat> in special procedures of the UN, which are um, particularly difficult to, to, to hold and implement. And over the past uh, one and a half year, of course, the situation has become even worse because on the one hand, um, the workload has been multiplied by, uh, I, I evaluated that about 20 uh, in, in August, September last year, with exactly the same um, resources, including human resources, which are very limited. I have one assistant in, in, in Geneva. And, uh, and and also it was difficult because, as you know, I have to very strict abide by the code of conduct for special procedures mandate holders, which demand independence, impartiality, objectivity, neutrality in the <clears throat> implementation of the mandate. and. Um, well, objectively, the situation has been going from bad to worse. And since the government does not recognize the mandate and does not cooperate with it, as was uh, rightly noticed by uh, one diplomat, uh, they have uh, adopted this uh, full ignorance policy now that uh, they even boycott, uh, don't attend any meetings um, at the third committee, nor do uh, the traditional uh, allies of, of Belarus. I was quite surprised that none of them raised the voice uh, on, on Monday, whereas when my colleague, Special Rapporteur on Iran, spoke uh, just after, uh, they were the usual suspects, you know, calling for, um, you know, that, that, that human rights are a domestic affair and, and this kind of thing. But even these statements we didn't hear on Monday during my interactive dialogue on, on Belarus. So it was not a dialogue at the end of the day. It was a monologue. It's been, uh, in my case, three years that I do this monologue with the government that doesn't uh, want to hear anything, doesn't want to build on the recommendations that we make in, in good faith and, and with a view of being constructive, not... Uh, 
and, and respectful of, of cultural specificities, but here the, um, the extent and the intensity of the human rights crisis does not leave any room for candor in a way. Uh, what I'm concerned about is that um, now we are having a closed communi- close, close conversation between um, people who are already convinced about the necessity to uphold uh, human rights and to do something about Belarus, but we are um, yeah, isolated from uh, the rest of Belarusian society, which is behind the propaganda shield. Uh, we are isolated from the uh, government, uh, which doesn't listen to us, and uh, the uh, from a number of countries which uh, which support the Belarusian stance just on the basis of uh, the notion of sovereignty and, and uh, non-interference in, in domestic affairs and non-politicization and these kind of things. So my main recommendation would be for the international community, for those who are on this call uh, among, I suppose, uh, the supporters of, of uh, 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 free and democratic Belarus and supporters of my mandate in particular, and I wish to thank them on that occasion, uh, you need to keep Belarus high on the agenda. Uh, at all costs, because the situation, as I see it, will not uh, improve. It can only go from bad to worse. Um, and uh, on the other hand, there might be other crises, human rights crises, humanitarian crises, environmental crises that will develop, unfortunately, in the coming months or years, and that will sort of come first uh, on the agenda and, uh, and and then we will be back to business as usual, thinking that, well, things are bad in Belarus, but they have been bad for 27 years, so why, why bother? Well, there is indeed... Um, a lot to be to be done to to maintain Belarus high on the on the agenda, because things can can get even worse. And and um, I would like to stress, if you allow me, uh, that uh, I was very very happy to hear all the the, the panelists. I was to to thank them for their very insightful comments. Uh, and uh, I support fully the uh, two two things that were said. First is that uh, people in exile including especially uh, women and whose husbands are in, in, uh, in, in detention and who are alone with the children, but not only families in general who have fled uh, Belarus, they still need support. Uh, not only human rights defenders, everybody now is, is, is a digital nomad, as you know, so it's sort of making things easier to, to support these people, even though they are not in an office, even though they are uh, sitting at home. Uh, as we all are, uh, they need support, they need uh, psychological support, they need financial and material support, uh, and on an everyday basis, myself living in, in, in Warsaw, Poland, I can see these waves of, of refugees coming from, from Belarus, Belarusians mostly, but not only, and uh, these people have uh, like huge challenges to face to put their children to school so that they can get some time for this, for themselves to heal their wounds, to take care of themselves, to, to build a future, to earn a living, to pay rent at the end of the month and, and to feed their children. So this is extremely serious and, and the support for civil society in general and for human rights defenders and others in exile in particular remains extremely, extremely um, important. And the second thing, um, I believe that uh, the the uh, the European Union uh, could do more also to to share best practices, and and uh, I very much agree with Anastasia Bekish that uh, there are platforms such as the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum, with which I have been co- collaborating ten years ago, uh, which offer a good uh, good basis for developing new partnerships. We have to be inventive. We have to. Um, you know, do with the situation as it is, seeing the challenges coming from this uh, massive repression in Belarus, but also the opportunities that have been paradoxically uh, raised by the pandemic that that, uh, make us all uh, much more flexible in a way to communicate and to act as we are doing now, discussing these things. It would have required me traveling to New York, for example, and, uh, two years ago. Uh, well, this is an opportunity and we also have to think positively and, and try and see uh, some uh, light at the end of the tunnel. And I really feel I need to express all my solidarity and sympathy with uh, those on this call who are um, victims of, of repression and promise them that I do my best every day on a voluntary basis to help things uh, get better, including to uh, help contribute with the to to the uh, holding the 
those responsible for grave human rights violations um, hold them to account. Uh, we are working very, very closely on this because I believe that unless they will feel some pressure, the perpetrators will not stop and the violence, including the torture, and the repression will unfortunately continue. So we are, this is a priority for me uh, uh, nowadays, and uh, I look forward to cooperating with all of you, including states, so that uh, this accountability mechanism established by the Human Rights Council delivers sooner than later. And again, this needs also some financial effort from the very member states we're talking with today. Thank you. Thank you, Anais, and for sharing with us about the important aspects of your work. Your work is so important and it means so much to those who believe in justice and equality and rights, and, 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 and it remains extremely inspiring, and we wish you all success and courage from, uh, from our side at Civicus, so the representative who I am. Uh, I'd like to go back to, to the panel, perhaps just for any last comment uh if there's one message you'd like to give to those who are on this call what would it be so can i start with you anastasia bekish you're, you're the first on, on on my screen here and then i'll go to irene and then to anastasia kostikova yes thank you very much mandeep for the closing remarks i'd like to share some numbers from the survey conducted by the gender-based organization in Belarus, which preferred to be unnamed during this event, unsurprisingly, unfortunately. And uh, 54 participants of this survey are not going now to leave the country, while 46 are now considering the options for relocation or have already left. So for me, it sounds very dangerous. And in this situation, we need to understand that if everyone leaves, who will stay and rebuild Belarus? And uh, as international community, we need to provide a support and very clear message for Belarusians that there is a light in the future and they're not alone. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Go to Irina now. Uh, I would like to, to thank uh, uh, all who support us, who uh, stand for, for Belarus, uh, who make efforts uh, and also to make pressure to, to Belarusian state and to change the situation. And uh, we hope that uh, it will not last long and in nearest future we will be able to return home and uh, start build new belarus and it, and we will need your support in this situation also and i hope that belarus will become a, a real part of democratic europe uh, soon and forever <laughs> Thank you, and that's a very important uh, aspiration. Well, uh, I can add something for this. Uh, I can thank everyone too. Uh, this is uh, this is very uh, this is very good that you're still here. You're still interested. You're still trying to do something, and. I know that everyone tired and maybe frustrated that it's a very long fight and it's not easy, but uh, this is my message for everyone. But uh, today is for you. Don't expect everything to be resolved by itself. The longer the situation lasts, the more it becomes the problem for everyone, not only for Belarus Belarusians. And you can see this already. So uh, I want to, uh, to wish you really stay inspired, uh, stay focused, and stay in touch with us because uh, only together we can solve this and only together we can win. Thank you. And, and, and just to, to, to sum up, this has been a really, been a really enlightening conversation. And, and, and first of all, I just want to, you know, to thank the panel. It takes so much courage to speak truth to power. As a, you know, as a, as a staff member of a global civil society alliance, I know the courage it takes. I know 
the the, the challenges you face in, a, in 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 your in your everyday work and 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 that's something that that is truly inspiring and that's what makes our world a better place so so thank you for what you do every day uh, so we've we've heard today about some of the challenges about you know just the basic exercise of fundamental freedoms that 75 years after the formation of the un still remain a work in progress 75 years after the commitment in the UN Charter to ins- to assure fundamental human rights and dignity and equality to every person still remain o- still remain unrealized in the case of Belarus and the everyday criminalization that people face merely for exercising their fundamental rights merely for asking for better and more participatory governance and it remains a challenge for the international community as a whole. But we have heard today. Uh, also about some of the some of the more endemic challenges also which 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 where the rule of law continues to to break down because it's not able to address issues like gender based violence which remain extremely serious and and gender based inequality and discrimination that 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 are huge challenges for belarus and there's a lot of work to be done in ensuring rule of law and 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 uh, realization of international standards in the country we also heard from from diplomatic community from the representatives in many countries who have expressed support it means a lot to activists when they have support of the international community i had the privilege of staying uh, for 9 years in south africa and many an anti apartheid activist mentioned how much they appreciated the support of democratic governments in their struggle including my own government in india which supported uh, the activist uh, those who were struggling against apartheid and and spoke out against the criminal act the uh, actions of that regime and, and lastly uh, a nice web thank you very much for sharing various aspects of the, of your work and also for the many challenges that you that you face and your message is very clear we all need to support your mandate your mandate is a very important link to the people of belarus and uh, and, and and really it it is incumbent on all of us to continue to ensure that you have the resources and you also have the access that you need to continue your work to ensure justice and rights for the people of Belarus i on that note i do want to give you the last word and ask before we close in case you have any final comments well i would like to thank you mandeep for a very good chairing of of this event and um well and and thank the the uh, delegations for for participating um and uh, yes well as long as i have the strength i will continue holding the the mandate and and trying my best to to try uh, to to get somewhere <laughs> it's um it's it's difficult it's frustrating but uh, i would like to thank uh, the both anastasia and and irina for for sharing uh their their dynamism their optimism nonetheless uh, you have to be resilient you have to be um courageous and um and you will succeed so this is uh, this is inspirational for for all of us who are working on a voluntary basis very often and in in challenging circumstances and with the very very few satisfactions at the end of the road but one day we will see the end of the the light at the end of the tunnel we'll see the end of the tunnel thank you thank you very much thank you very much uh, and i'm going to hand it back to the staff of the european union who have helped make this possible and for all the tireless support for this event and for also their patience with all of us thank you Well, like said this may be a little bit outside the script uh, because I'm not sure that I was asked to come back in but I just want to say uh, on behalf of the European Union and my very very strong personal conviction I really wanted to express my great admiration for the work that the three women who have been presenting to us today are doing I hope you feel strongly that you are not alone in this I'm horrified with the stories you tell about the harassment you encounter on a daily basis and the fact that some have lost uh, hope um and uh, are leaving the country because of um because of the pressure 
I just hope that we can rebuild the, the trust that you need to feel from us so that you can um, feel that you're not alone and that uh, eventually, as Maureen was saying, this will, this will change to the better and you will be the agents of that change with the support uh, of us. So let's just keep this up. Please do keep us informed about uh, everything that goes on and we will do our best to support you in any way we can. And let's uh, remain hopeful. Uh, regimes like these will not last in, uh, in the European context. It's just so contrary to everything else that is going on. Um, so we'll just need to have a certain amount of patience, courage and insistence and resilience. So thank you very much for you do. I'm, I'm just full of admiration. Thank you. I think we've come to, uh, to a conclusion, uh, Marit, do you agree or, or are you expecting other interventions? Otherwise, I would just like to wish everyone a, a good day and I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, today and for keeping this fight going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.